Hello and welcome back to the last in our series of restoration specials of Inside the Tanks. And today we're going to look at this, the Sherman M4A4. And to take a closer look, we're once again joined by Gavin from Armage Engineering Limited. Gav, once again, thank you for taking your time out here. Now, Sherman, we've done plenty of videos over the years about Shermans, but this is a particularly special Sherman. Yeah, so this one is, uh, it's the only one left in the UK um, that, that was used by the British because um, there are only two others left that are, are in running condition and they've unfortunately one's in America now and the other one is in Belgium. So yeah, last one left. Now, what, what are your major takeaways when you got this? Now, unlike obviously what we've, we've seen in previous two episodes, certainly a lot larger, um, I would argue a little bit more complicated or perhaps not. No, so the complexity of this from the outside, it looks very difficult, but actually when you get into it, it's, it's very well designed, very easy to work on. Um, it's just big and cumbersome. And what about, I mean, Sherman's obviously mass produced a lot of, we talked before on the other two vehicles about spares and the availability of spares and things. Is it a lot easier for something like a Sherman? So the Sherman chassis, as it stands, is fairly easy to get spares for, but to get the multi-bank specific spares, it's almost unobtainable. So when you received this Sherman, Gav, what particular condition was it in? So I actually received it after I'd already restored it which is a bit of a strange way around. I'd, I'd, I'd actually done a partial restoration whilst working for someone else. Um, and then uh, it was purchased and then sent to me for a, a full restoration. So we took everything out, repainted everything. We, anything that was wrong with it, we, we repaired and, and put it all back and got, got it into the state it is in today. So you mentioned before it was, it was sat on a range when uh, obviously it's, uh, <laughs> before it actually came to any sort of restoration. Yeah, so it's the first bit of history we really know about it. We don't really know what it did during the war where it was or who used it. But we do know it was used as a range wreck on Salisbury Plain uh, as a hard target. So this entire um, side panel had been shot to pieces um, and had been replaced at, you know, at some point. And you know I'm obsessed with names, so why Belle? So Belle um, is a, a French sweetheart name. Um, the name begins with B to reflect that it's a B squadron. Um, and it's just a, an easier way of, for, for other tank crews to recognise, oh, that's one of, one of our gang. So the beating heart of this tank, Gav? Uh, yes, the, this is the Chrysler multi-bank engine. Um, you can see you've got the five carburetors across the top there. That was actually on like the second variation of this engine. Um, just makes it easier to tune because they've got different length inlet pipes. When, when you open the throttle, the, uh, the en all five engines respond in a different fashion. So it wasn't the best idea. Now, to me, it looks like it's a relatively easy engine to work on, to maintain, is it? Uh, yes and no, depends what you want to do. Um, so you can change the spark plugs in situ, just about, by going through the top and from underneath. Um, and you can adjust things like the points and the ignition timing, you know, and, and adjust the mixture on the carburetors and stuff. So it, it's fairly easy to tune, but to actually do any physical work on, you're better off taking it out. And how long would it take you on average then to take this, this engine out? So two, two guys that are familiar with the job would take about four hours. Um, it, it's actually a really simple design. It's, in my opinion, one of the, the first pack designs I've ever seen. When I mean pack, I mean the engine and the cooling system are all uh, intertwined and connected together. Um, and all you need to do is, is unplug the electrics, disconnect the, the, the drive shafts and the fuel lines, and the whole lot comes out together. Now, you obviously have dealt with a multitude of engines. Where would you put this one in there as far as you know, reliability, perhaps? I wouldn't say um, it's the most reliable um, or the most complex. It's actually quite straightforward. It just looks complicated. Um, it's just delicate is probably the word I'd use. Um, and again, I've always said on the, on the other vehicles as well, Gav, the, the, uh, the bits and bobs you've got all over the place, the cam nets, fitted, the boxes. I believe there's quite an interesting story about the one on the rear there. Uh, yeah, so the, 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 the weathered box that we've got on the rear there, that was, that was donated to us on a 30 core trip in Holland. Um, in 2019 by um, a retired school teacher who said that that box had been left in Holland in, in World War II um, and then remained in the school and it was full of history books. So all the kids learned about history from the books that were kept in the box. Um, and they felt it was really important that the box ended up on a vehicle that would have been passing through the village in World War II. Oh, fantastic. So we're now joined by the owner of the collection that we've looked at over the last three episodes, Mr. William Bannister. Firstly, William, thank you so much for allowing us access to your incredible collection. And I suppose the big question is, why tanks? No idea, really. <laughs> <laughs> 
when I was about eight or nine, like all boys do, they're like trains, planes, whatever else. And I got a book on tanks and I just loved them like big dinosaurs. Uh, and I studied it and all, as you do as a teenager, I came here when I was about 12 or 13 with my parents. I badgered them so much, we came back again when we were on holiday. Um, and I just enjoyed it. And of course then in your twenties, you forget about these things and you put that book on the shelf. But about 15 years ago, I got back involved with the museum and, and was able to rekindle my interest. So as a collector, do you, is there a, a clear idea in your mind? It's not just that maybe something comes up on the market, you've got the opportunity to buy, or do you go out there with a, a clear thought of, I am after this particular type? I've got a few on my bucket list, but the main reason for me doing it is I do enjoy them, I love them, but is to maybe keep history alive and help the Bo Bovington Museum in some way, in the sense that they've got a fantastic collection, but not all of the vehicles run. And if we can have one or two vehicles um, uh, here that actually are running, you're keeping history alive for the public because they've got a, a limit to what they can have as a running collection. And also just try and save vehicles um, you know, from leaving the UK. This vehicle would have left the UK, and it's one of only three in the world. Um, a current vehicle that uh, we're restoring, a Centaur, again, was likely to leave the UK. And they should really be here at all possible, being enjoyed by the UK public. So that's the sort of mad philosophy behind the collection, although I must admit the Chaffee is a, a tank I always liked as a boy. <laughs> and I mean, we've seen clearly seen throughout these episodes that the attention to detail is something which has completely you know, blown me away, to be honest. That's very The kind. attention to detail inside the turret in particular, we'll have a look at this one in a moment, but um, is that something, would you say you're quite, um, what, what's the word? I think you're trying to tell me I'm anal. Um, <laughs> I would certainly wouldn't say that. No, in, in fairness, um, Gavin and I are as bad as each other. I mean, I do like things done well, yes, and if you're going to do it, and especially you're going to try and put it on display uh, as a sort of bit of history, it, it's worth going the extra mile. And, and we've got time and we try to find bits all the time, and there are other people who do fantastic jobs, but for here we just wanted to try and get them up to a, a spec where they left the factory as close as we can, and also then to add one or two touches to pay homage to the, the crews who served them in them, to give them a bit of human side as well. Yeah, because I would say all of your vehicles have got, almost got a personality, if that makes sense. You know, there's, there's something very different about them. We try. I mean, obviously, there's a, there's a, the crew stations have particular 1940s photos, all original pin-up girls from the 40s. They have names that mean something to perhaps to a crew would have served somewhere. Um, and so, yes, there's a bit of something. We just try and do not just not just about the vehicle, it's about the people who served and, and all that sort of history around it. Fantastic. Can we have a look inside? Absolutely. So inside the Torrent William, I mean, firstly, obviously quite a lot of space inside this um, particular vehicle. And again, looking around here, everything, I can see the canteens, grenades, you know, small arms, small arms ammunition, uh, wireless set. It is absolutely incredible. Well, thank you very much. I mean, it's all attributed to the Gavin and, and, and the guys. Um, yes, we tried to put everything back that we could. So um, some of the bits to be remade, some uh, refurbished, bits sourced from all over the place. Um, but no, it's uh, pretty well complete. Was there anything in particular in here that you, you had trouble finding or locating? One thing we've just only just located is the, uh, the commander's uh, override traverse handle. Um, and that we yet to fit, and Gavin can show you that later on, but um, that goes up here. And um, that obviously enables the commander to uh, take control of the turret traverse to get the gunner online. Um, but that was particularly hard to find. Somebody very kindly pointed us in the right direction. And that's now got to be fitted because, of course, this, you know, the turret fully works, the traverse system works and everything. So it's nice to get it. But points of reference for this, when I get inside, I mean, it's, you know, it's all right, relatively I'm straightforward. You've got archive footage, you've got footage, you've got manuals of the exteriors of the vehicles, of, you know, the transmission, the gearbox, et cetera. But of course, inside the actual turret, there's not so much around. I mean, how do you source all that sort of information? Uh, we honest with you, everybody spends a lot of time on forums and the internet, and people are actually just very good. And, and, and if you're interested in something, you, they just pop up. Um, and I'm trying to think of something at the moment, but the, the, the remarkably small items just suddenly come up as it all have that. Or the pouch for the flags and the chaffee, for instance, that, that came up or whatever else. So you're just trying to get all the bits and pieces. Um, and I know you've had over the years numerous veterans, of course, that, um, that come in here. I mean, of course, they must be a great source of information for you. Yeah, they are. Uh, they are. And, and again, it, it's finding the right footage, people's commentary. And, and well, just talking about Murray Walker, who came to the museum, and he told us the anecdote about he welded a, um, a 30 calibre ammunition box the outside of his Sherman turret, filled it with hand grenades, and uh, when he, the Germans got a bit close, he'd pop the hatches, chuck a few grenades from the box, and go back in again. And so in, in memory of that, and Murray actually sort of uh, telling us that, uh, we've got a 30 caliber 
box on the outside of the turret with grenades in it. Now we're inside the tank, uh, talking about it, that you've obviously spent a lot of time living in your tank, but we got rather attached to this particular Sherman, not just because we've been working on it, but we did the 30 call uh, trip in Holland, which Gavin mentioned earlier on. Um, and we've sort of personalized this vehicle and uh, the various pinup girls you mentioned. But actually my story about driving there was that I was driving it, not only it was very tiring, and it is a big, heavy vehicle to drive, difficult to change gear. Um, but I should have changed down from from third to second when going round a roundabout. And all I can say is the Dutch are extremely good. We did chew up quite a few cobbles. I missed the house, which was very good. And, um, and but I didn't realize in being so concentrated at the front end that I just missed the lamp post at the back end of the tank by about six inches. But uh, overall, um, it, it's been a great time when we're all together in, in this vehicle. So doing the work to it now uh, uh, and all the various maintenance, it, it just, it's, she's one of the family now. So it's fair, fair to say it's a labor of love. Yes, it's a stupid project. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's always something to do. I mean, they're old, I mean, they're 80 years old. There's always some fettling to do, something goes wrong, something leaks, but they're, they're you know, vehicles you've just got to keep, keep working on. And the next major job for this one, hopefully being up for Tank Best and 2023, but in 2024, we're going back to Holland. That's our, our hope and plan. Um, so before that, we'll have the engine out, do a complete shakedown. Hopefully then we'll, we'll make it all the way from the Belgian border to Nijmegen. And William, as I said before, thank you so much for allowing us access. Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned ongoing projects at the moment. If, as a dream, if there was anything at all that you could perhaps own, restore? There's a couple on my bucket list I won't mention. But, but, <laughs> but what I can say, as, as I mentioned earlier, we are doing a Centaur, which obviously is a Cromwell with a Liberty engine and early Cromwell. Uh, and that actually is, is going to be an interesting project and, and Gavin's busy on that. Um, it's, uh, it's nice to get a British tank. Again, we didn't want it to leave the UK and uh, hearing that Liberty engine go again, we've got it running and uh, it'll be exciting. Nice to see it around the track and the public to enjoy it. So that'll be a little, little time off, a few months and then probably, probably 18 months. So we've now moved down to the front. I'm in the bow gunner's position, Gav in the driver's cab there. Um, Gav, what's your experience of driving this Sherman? Uh, this particular Sherman, I've got quite a bit of experience, uh, mainly from the 30 core trip we did in Holland uh, in 2019. Uh, I've got vivid memories of, of climbing out after a long day's driving and having sore shoulders. So the, the epaulettes on the, on the ovals we wore would be rubbing against the underside of the turret because you'd be moving backwards and forwards. Um, uh, and, the, and the other thing we've had to do on this vehicle is we've, we've put a, a modification for the driver. It's a footrest we've bolted up quite high. Um, when you're doing slow manoeuvring, uh, trying to shunt it in and out of a, a tight spot. You really need just a little bit more rhubarb to get it to, to do its thing. So that having the foot plate there, you can get your foot right up and, and really yank on the tillers. So would you say it's an easy vehicle to drive or not particularly? Uh, not particularly, no. It, it's not my favourite vehicle to drive, put it that way. So what is your favourite then, Gav? Uh, the Chaffee, without a doubt. <laughs> without a doubt. It's just a point and squirt. As an all-round general purpose tank, the Sherman was one of the best tanks of the Second World War. Design of the M4 medium tank dates back to April 1941. A prototype model was ready in September of 41, and production began in February 1942. During World War II, the Sherman spearheaded many offences by the Allies after 1942. And that's it with our restoration specials. A massive thank you to Gav from Armoured Engineering Limited, and of course to William for allowing us access to his incredible collection. Until next time, take care.